Good morning and welcome. This is the Sunday after Easter Sunday, and we hope that the resurrection of Jesus has been a present reality for you in your heart and mind this week, that his conquering of death has brought you light in this dark time. I know that that's something that can be really easy to forget, especially as so many things in us and around us um, would tell us a different story, uh, a, a different reality. That's one of the reasons that we are so thankful that you are watching, that we get to do this again. We are simply forgetful, but we get to do this. We get to be reoriented once again to God's truths, to have our, our hearts, our minds, and our bodies reoriented to the love and the beauty and the mercy of God. Again, we are so happy that you are with us. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's take just a few moments to quiet our hearts and minds before we get started today. Call to worship this morning is Isaiah 40, 20 through 31. Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary. The young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let's pray. Almighty God, you are our creator. And while we are limited in so many ways, physically and mentally, your understanding and power are infinite. This is so comforting for us to read. God, you are good and wonderful and deserving of all of our love and devotion. Through your spirit, would you help us bring you glory this morning? May we pray and sing with sincerity. May we receive your word with open hearts and minds. Through Christ we pray. Amen.
God is so beautiful that in his light, we cannot help but be reminded and even see the ugliness of our sin. For this reason, confession and repentance must be normal parts of our lives. So let's, let's do that now. Would you please pray with me? Father in heaven, we need to be forgiven. We have tried to heal ourselves instead of trusting in the death of Jesus Christ. We have tried to work off our guilt. We have tried so hard to pile up good deeds that would somehow out outweigh our sin. And when this doesn't work, we quickly turn to denial and distraction. Instead of trusting in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have tried to change through our own efforts. We've tried to change our hearts through sheer willpower. This has left some of us arrogant. This has left most of us anxious, maybe even depressed. Forgive us for trying to heal ourselves. Forgive us for neglecting your grace. Forgive us and heal us. For Jesus' sake, it's through him we pray. Amen. We cannot fix or free or heal ourselves. But while we were sinners, against all conditions, this is what God has done for us. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. So then, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Jesus has paid the debt for our sin and is now our advocate and mediator before the throne of God. So let's sing that song together. Perfectly, the great high priest. 
mentioned before, because there are so many things in us and around us that would sell us a different reality, a different story, it's so important um, that we be reoriented, reminded, and in, in this time, proclaim what we believe. We proclaim um, that we believe in the Father, Son, and Spirit, that this is our reality. So, would you please with me read the Apostles' Creed? We believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Being the recipients of God's love and mercy changes everything for us. One of the things that it means is that we now have peace with all of God's children. So to celebrate and to experience this blessing of God, let's take two minutes to reach out to one another, to offer signs of peace and love.
morning, Redeemer. Please join me in a prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your grace and your goodness. We thank you that you have given us all that we need in Christ. You've given us his righteousness. You've given us forgiveness of our sins. You've given us freedom to live with hope and joy of life everlasting. Father, we want to continue to pray for the coronavirus. We pray specifically that you would help our doctors and nurses to continue to provide and care for people. We hope, though, that a vaccine can be found so that many people can be cured, uh, that we can all move forward from this. But, Father, as it does remain, please give us perseverance in light of the gospel to continue to live out each and every day uh, without fear, with, with nothing but joy and hope that you are sovereign. We want to pray for some of our own families at Redeemer. Uh, we will pray for the Friesen family, the Ruiz family, the Araujo family, as they have all lost loved ones uh, recently, a few because of the COVID virus. We pray for them, Father. Help them to grieve. Help them to grieve with hope. Help them to grieve with thoughts of great memories of their loved ones. Uh, may their families be able to um, comfort one another in whatever ways possible and help us to also do so. Uh, we also pray for those who have chronic pains or, or maybe uh, they struggle with depression, during, especially during this time. Father, we pray that you would help them to find hope and joy in the midst of this time. Help them to cling to your word. Help them to remember your promises and that you are faithful and that on the cross you have already given them life and joy and freedom from their sins. And may this help them each day to continue to move forward in the midst of the struggles that they have. Father, we also want to pray for the Rimstead family, for David and Emily as they uh, minister to the tribe of the Maliali people in Papua New Guinea. Father, we pray that you'd give them endurance, help them to continue to learn the language so that they can learn how to write the Bible in their language so that the people there can read the Bible, that they can read the gospel, they can hear the stories of the gospel. And Father, we plead and pray with you that you would rescue the Maliali tribe, every single one of them, and use David and Emily to be a huge part of that along with their teammates. Lord, we also want to pray for a few local congregations. We want to pray for Magnolia Church and for St. John's Missionary Baptist Church, for Monty and Corey as they pastor these churches. Father, give them wisdom and discernment each and every week as they try and shepherd their flocks, as they try and preach the word and minister with the word to their people. We pray that you would help them in the near future as we hopefully get to begin to go back to normal, that they would have wisdom to know uh, how to move forward each and every week, when, when to gather or how long to stay separated. Help them to care for their people. Uh, we also pray for these churches that their people would be full of joy in Christ and that they would continue to grow in this time in their faith. We also want to pray for the country of Algeria and for our persecuted brothers and sisters there. Father, please give them uh, confidence and give them boldness to continue to share and live out the gospel in the midst of persecution. We pray that, that they would be able to display the beauty and the value of Jesus as they show that they are willing to maybe even lose their own lives in order to remain faithful to Christ. And we pray and hope that those who are persecuting them would see this amazing and beautiful faith and that it would draw them to the cross, it would draw them to Jesus, and that they would repent and believe in Jesus and join our family, and join us in worshiping you. And last, we want to pray for the lost. We pray for the lost among us. Father, we pray and hope that in the midst of this COVID virus, that you would be displaying to people all across the world that we are not as smart and as strong and as amazing as we think we are. That as far along as we are in science, we are still not that far along. And Father, please show us how desperately we need you. Help to tear down walls in people's hearts and minds. That they would see their need. That they would be hungry for truth. And that you would help us to be bold to share that truth with them. That, that they need Jesus. That Jesus can and will save them if they would repent and believe in him. 
May we be bold to do so. And may you do a great work in and through us around the world, through all brothers, through all of our brothers and sisters. And may you be glorified and honored in all of it. We pray all of this in the name of Christ. Amen. Our sermon text this morning is Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. As we prepare to hear from God's word, please pray with me. Almighty God, you have spoken to us through your Son. Let your written word now be spoken and heard by each of us. Give us ears to hear and hearts to understand that we may not refuse your calling or ignore your voice. May we all be taught by you through your powerful word. Bring our every thought captive to obeying Christ, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Now hear the word of the Lord. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. Well, this is our last sermon in the book of Matthew. Beginning next week, we uh, open up with a series in the book of Hebrews, which uh, is going to be amazing. Uh, there's very few books that are going to give us such a brilliant portrait of Jesus as the book of Hebrews. But this is a fantastic text to end on. It's a very famous text in a lot of ways, and we've already heard it preached early on in the, uh, our time together in Matthew. Uh, I want to concentrate uh, maybe in a little bit different direction than Zane did uh, and, uh, and open this text up to us again. Uh, it was just read to us, uh, but, but just uh, uh, to, for my own sake, I'm going to just kind of read it again as we go into, the, uh, into our time together. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountains which Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is uh, a, a remarkable uh, text in one way, to uh, a great way rather, to, to end uh, our time in this book. Uh, and um, this text gives us several things that we can just grab hold of uh, on our way out of uh, the book of Matthew. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to, to talk about, uh, first of all, that the facts that ground us are disorienting but true. The facts that ground us are disorienting but true. And then we're going to talk about the ideas that drive us. The ideas that drive us. And then we're going to talk about the mission before us. The mission before us. The facts that ground us. The ideas that drive us. The mission before us. The facts that ground us here are disorienting. Uh, but in fact, they're true. They're historical, rigorously historical facts. Uh, and, and so we, we look back in our text. You've got these 11 disciples that come to Galilee. You'll notice that they never speak. This is a moment for the disciples to listen, to understand, and to obey, to resolve to obey. And so here, this is a great place for us. That here we're looking at uh, this, this scene that Matthew has given us. And we think to ourselves, as we move out of Matthew, we want to hear God's word. We want to understand as best we can. We want to obey as best we can. It's a great attitude uh, to, to, leave the, to leave the book with. Here are the 11 uh, show up. There doesn't seem to be any indication there are more uh, than, than just the 11 here uh, to this mountain in Galilee that Jesus directed them to. Um, there's, uh, there's no indication of where exactly this is, but more than likely it's a place where both Jesus and his disciples had met routinely. And, and so here, a week or so after the resurrection, uh, time for Jesus to uh, show himself multiple times as you've recorded in the book of Acts. Uh, here they they meet one last time, and uh, and when they see him, they 
fall uh, on their face and worship him. The the word here uh, this utilizes they just they they, they fall down uh, face first uh, and and worship. And but it says that some doubted uh, and or or even the word some are hesitant. The last time, in fact, that we saw this uh, uh, term is. Um, in uh, chapter 14, uh, verse 31 and verse 33, where you also have a connection between worship and hesitancy or worship and doubt. This is when Peter uh, wants to walk on the water. He's confronted by the reality of the elements and he simply buckles under the weight of that. Uh, or Jesus is worshiped uh, in the boat as the one who can control the elements, but Peter in the face of the elements doubts. Uh, and um, and this, of course, uh, is, is what is happening here. One writer notes that it could also be that while they're falling on their face of worshiping, they also, their hesitancy or their disorientation here might be due to the fact that the last time they were all together was in the Garden of Gethsemane. They all left Jesus by himself. And so yeah, I think this is instructive for us is that, is that here, Jesus' disciples, the followers of Jesus, precursors to who we are, these are worshiping but doubting people, worshiping but disoriented people. And they're disoriented for the fact that here they're looking at the living Christ and people aren't supposed to get out of the grave and live. Here they're looking at the Christ who, who, who they just left, who they just forsook. And people that are as powerful as this just don't forgive things like that. And, and, and yet... The reality is that a part and parcel of the stuff that drives us to worship is the fact that Jesus is in fact alive and is in fact better than we could possibly imagine. And here, these disorienting facts really matter. I keep on noting that they're facts, uh, and I, um, uh, I, I think that that's a, a good thing to, to continue to remember. The... Um, um, a few years back, James Cameron, uh, the, the gentleman that produced Titanic and Avatar, a really brilliant movie producer, uh, came up with uh, this, this concept or this idea. Uh, uh, he and a, an investigative reporter out of Israel that, uh, that, that the, uh, there was a, an archaeological tomb that they had found or that had been found, and they were convinced that this was the actual tomb of Jesus and they had found an ossuary with Jesus' bones in it and, and, and things like this. Um, and it was, it was interesting to see the fallout of all this. Of course, this did not, this didn't pan out, uh, to be, uh, to be demonstrable as they wanted it to be. Uh, but they cre created this documentary. You can only imagine with Cameron behind it. It was really brilliantly done. Um, but it wasn't received very well by the archaeological community. And I'm not talking about Christians. I'm talking about just archaeologists in general. In fact, one of the archaeologists referred to it as archaeoporn, uh, and, uh, and, and said that it was just, it was a shameful attempt at, uh, at rendering his discipline. And in, uh, while all of that was admittedly um, entertaining for me to watch uh, at, at that level, the more bizarre interviews were the interviews that Ted Koppel did with a series of clergy. There were probably about eight clergy up on the stage with Koppel, and only one of them, uh, Daryl Bach, was an evangelical. Everyone but Bach said, Jesus does not have to actually have been risen from the dead. So it doesn't matter if they find his actual body because an actual historically risen Jesus, Christianity just doesn't need that. Because Christianity is, um, is more about, you know, the reality of, of, of the person's own perception of the divine. Well, they got to Daryl Bach, and Bach said, it absolutely matters. Um, the Apostle Paul addresses this in Corinthians. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, we're pathetic. Those who follow Jesus are just the most pathetic people ever. Uh, we're still in our sins. Our faith is futile. There's nothing to it. Um, it really does matter. And the points of the historical reasonableness of the resurrection are really significant. Um, and this is, in fact, this is so significant that even agnostics like Bart Ehrman have acknowledged that the, um, the empty tomb uh, and the, the, the reality of the crucifixion and the empty tomb are simply facts. Now, he doesn't, he doesn't come to the conclusion that Jesus rose from the dead, uh, but he does, 
he does acknowledge that there is no getting around these facts. Jesus was in fact dead. The, Rom the Romans knew how to kill people. They weren't they weren't uh, you know they weren't amateurs at this. They were really good at killing people. There's no indication that Jesus was anything but dead on the cross. The tomb, in fact, was empty. If Jesus' enemies could have produced a body, they most certainly would have produced a body. Um, the early Christians actually lost the location of the tomb. If you go to Israel now and you go to the empty tomb, you may or may not be in the actual empty tomb. Um, but they, they simply lost it. It was of no import to them because they had the real Jesus. They had the living Jesus who walked out of it. In fact, it's interesting that the... Um, uh, the, the story that the Jewish leaders come up with is that the disciples stole the body, um, just thereby admitting that the tomb itself was empty. Uh, and and uh, even, the, even the story there. So, so th this is not, th these, are not, these are not things that are made up in the minds of Christians. These are facts that are acknowledged pretty much all the way across the board, conservative and liberal alike. Uh, the disciples believed they were really seeing the real Jesus. They were willing to die for Jesus. There's one thing to, to be willing to die for an ideal, like, uh, like, uh, like, other, like my, other religions might require of you, or patriotism for your country, or something like that. But it's another thing to say, I'm, I'm willing to die because I know this individual is no longer dead. That is an incredible concept. But this is exactly what you bump into all throughout Acts. You have Jesus appearing to the disciples, to non-believers, like his brother James, uh, and, and like Saul of Tarsus, who later became Paul, uh, to 500 people at one time. There have been uh, people who have advocated that these were all hallucinations, but... 500 people don't have the same hallucination. It, it, that's just a bizarre idea. In fact, these kinds of uh, attempts at explaining uh, the biblical data have, have fallen uh, on hard times. The earliest followers of Jesus were Jewish, and they began to reorient their religious practice around not their race, not their ethnicity, or not the religion they were brought up with, but around the person of Jesus. While baptism certainly had its Jewish precursors, now baptism was about people aligning themselves and, and representing themselves, proclaiming the reality of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus as it applied to them. Dead with Jesus, buried with Jesus, raised to walk in newness of life with Jesus. The Lord's Supper became uh, something that was practiced constantly as a proclamation of the goodness and the power of Jesus as a memory for uh, believers to constantly remember that Jesus uh, is among them. And, and remember the idea of remembering, particularly with, uh, with regard to covenant, all throughout the Old Testament, is not because uh, you know, people, uh, you know, uh, people forget. In fact, oftentimes, God was the one that was remembering. And, and so it wasn't so much he was remembering, but it was, it was uh, for example, the ephod of the high priest and all the 12 stones there for, was for God to remember his covenant. Well, God wasn't going to forget his covenant, but he put something in front of the people of Israel to let them know that he was ever mindful of his covenant. And so in the same way, when we take the supper, when these early Jewish Christians took the supper, they were remembering Jesus. Jesus was ever mindful in front of them. Jesus was always with them. Jesus would be where they would go to one day. And, and so all, all of this uh, kind of oriented itself around the living Jesus. Sunday as a worship day, replaced Sabbath day as a sign day. This was uh, a remarkable kind of, uh, kind of things. These are the facts, disorienting as they might be. Uh, these are the facts that drive us. I think I, I, one of the things that, that is important for us to, to think about is are we driven? And I, I've thought about this ever since the sermon last week, actually. And I, I was working is how driven is Redeemer Baptist Church by the resurrection of Jesus? We do a great job of talking about and singing about the crucifixion of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus as the, as the one who uh, uh, absorbs the wrath of God for our sin. We, 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 we do a really great job at doing that. But are we driven also equally by the resurrection of Jesus, that Jesus is alive, that when we gather together, Jesus is present among us, that when we uh, are, 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 are 
under the weight of uh, the, the moment uh, of the COVID-19 moment, Jesus is with us. Um, that, that if, in fact, we're ever persecuted for our faith, like m- so many of our brothers and sisters are, Jesus is with us. Um, this, this doesn't even have to look pristine. Uh, in fact, we can be like these disciples, ever worshiping, ever doubting, and we can claim, like the man in John 6, Oh, Lord, please help me with my unbelief. And Jesus is with us. Jesus is so good. Jesus is genuinely alive. And that I, I think that's supposed to drive us. The facts that ground us are really, really, I- I disorienting as they may be, should drive us to worship. The facts that ground us, disorienting as they may be, should drive us to worship. We shouldn't wait until we feel like we've got it all under wraps because the ideas themselves are so rich. And that brings us to our second point. The ideas that drive us are enduring ideas. These ideas that drive us are enduring ideas. And the first idea is what we've been talking about, the resurrection of Jesus. Throughout the New Testament, uh, believers are really shaped by this notion of resurrection. My question about us as Redeemer Baptist Church, are we really shaped by resurrection? Uh, For example, in the New Testament, resurrection is, is the thing that ensures justification. Uh, Paul in Romans chapter 4 verse 25 says that Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses, raised for our justification. When we think about our own justification, when we think about the fact that we're saved, we should be we should be grounding that and we should be driven by thinking about uh, the fact that we're saved by the risen Jesus. Jesus is alive. That's why I'm saved. Uh, this idea is, is significant. But, but likewise, um, the, the reality of our conversion, uh, the fact that once we were blind and now we see, once we uh, remained in the tomb, a great hymn by Wesley, long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening or a life giving ray i awoke the dungeon flamed with light my chains fell off my heart was free i rose went forth and followed thee that that brilliant picture of conversion the moment that we're brought to life this is driven in the new testament our resurrection uh, peter we we read this text uh last uh, last week but i want to go back to it first peter chapter one verse three blessed Be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus' resurrection is the thing that ensures and drives our own regeneration, our own uh, life-giving, or our own life that's been given to us by God. Ephesians chapter 2, brilliant picture. Uh, uh, Here we're dead in our transgressions at the beginning of chapter 2, but yet God made us alive and raises us together with Christ and sits us with him in the heavenly places. Really brilliant uh, portrait of, uh, of, of, of our own conversion of being granted life. Uh, Colossians chapter three, if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated. This is, uh, this, this is a uh, re- refocuses our eyes. We've talked about Psalm 73 multiple times about how right in the middle of the Psalm, the presence of God, the promises of God, refocus the Psalmist's eyes. Here, even more so, the resurrection of Jesus if, in fact, we've been raised with Christ, if you are in Christ, we talked about that uh, a lot last time, uh, last week, then then you should focus your eyes on those things that are driven by Christ. I, I, I am the worst among us uh, of, of allowing my eyes to fall to the world around me. And yet the resurrection of Jesus is supposed to drive me to focus on those things that are above, thinking of those things that are above. Uh, and and this, is, this is just part of what the resurrection does. The resurrection also shapes us ethically. Seeing the resurrection, for example, in 1 uh, Corinthians 15, or not so much seeing the resurrection, but the reality of the resurrection, receiving the grace of God, sets Paul to work. If the grace of God has been given to me, I worked harder than all of them. It's supposed to drive sin uh, 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 and uh, fighting. It produces this element of of muscle and teeth to to guard against sin. Ramus chapter 6, we were buried therefore with him 
by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, that we might also be raised to walk in newness of life. This idea is, is, is just reiterated throughout Romans 6. A little bit later in Romans 6, consider yourselves dead to sin, alive to God. This is all driven by the resurrection. Let the resurrection drive you but not just the resurrection. The a second idea that drives us, an enduring idea that drives us, is the sovereignty of the resurrected Jesus. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He is, in fact, God Almighty, blessed forever. This has uh, been portrayed all through Matthew. It's been portrayed. It's portrayed throughout the Gospels. That is why Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John exist. They're eyewitness testimonies to who Jesus is, what Jesus did, and and uh, and who Jesus is is God Almighty, blessed forever. Uh, who Jesus is, is the, the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. Who Jesus is, is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Who Jesus is, is the one who sits on the throne and the Lamb. It, it belongs blessing and glory and power and honor. There the Lamb is yet once again. Who Jesus is, is King of all kings, Lord of all lords, the sovereignty of the resurrected Jesus. Who Jesus is, is even sovereign over the elements that we find ourselves in that are, that are troubling, that are problematic. In other words, one of the reasons I got asked by a friend of mine, a former pastor, he, uh, he and I were talking, and I told him that we separate, celebrated the supper uh, every week, and then I sort of jokingly ribbed him. He's a mentor of mine, so I've, I've, I've got a good relationship with him. But I sort of gently ribbed him, and I said, and so should you. And uh, he, said, he said, tell me why. And I said, this is why, among other things, that each time that we at Redeemer Baptist Church pick up the bread and the drink, we pick up the tangible proclamation of the goodness and power of God. It doesn't matter what we, we really might be. We might be sick with COVID-19. We might be looking, our, our brothers and sisters overseas might be looking at persecution. Um, we might be looking at death or, or, or people around us that, that, that might be dying. These things are all sometimes inexplicable pain, but part of living between Genesis 3 and Revelation 22. But those things don't define if God is good. Here is what defines God is good. Even if these things are profoundly as disorienting as the magnificence of the resurrection, they, they, are, they are brought back to an even keel testimony. You can only say so much about God with these things. Here is where God's really proclaimed as good, really proclaimed as powerful, really proclaimed as sovereign. Jesus is sovereign and good and powerful. Here is his crucifixion. Here is his shedding of his blood and the pouring out of his body. Here is uh, the place where we celebrate the resurrected Jesus that we'll once again see and that we know is always with us. Here is where we find this. The sovereignty of Jesus, the sovereignty of the resurrected Jesus defines uh, the, the, uh, our world for us. It, it reshapes our narrative for us. But also, as I just mentioned, it's not just simply the resurrected Jesus that drives us, the sovereignty of Jesus that drives us, but it's also the ever-present Jesus that drives us. In the first century, I think it meant a great deal to Christians undergoing persecution that Jesus was with them. Jesus was with them. The Spirit uh, was with them. Uh, th this, was, this was a powerful element. We are not alone. Um, oftentimes, we talk about being a disciple, and we'll talk about this in a second. We talk about walking up the mountain. And I realized, as I was thinking about this this week, that, that could lead us to some different word pictures that we that really we don't believe. Like, for example, that Jesus is at the top of the mountain, and we're all walking up to get to Jesus. Um, but that's not the case. We're walking with Jesus to get to Jesus. As mind-blowing as that is, this is the idea. Uh, Jesus who is interceding for us, along with the Spirit, who is interceding for us, uh, uh, with the Father. We're, 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 we're walking with them. They're present with us. We're moving up, up uh, uh, to the very place that they're at. Maybe a good uh, picture of this is uh, in uh, Harry Potter. 
uh, and the Deathly Hallows. Um, as as Potter is going uh, to um, this is this is actually in the movie. In the movie, uh, also um, is, is is Potter is going to face Voldemort in the woods, and Voldemort's going to kill him. He's going voluntarily to be killed by Voldemort. He finds the Resurrection Stone and this the, the little snitch that he ha had caught in his first game of Quidditch, and and, uh, and his parents. And other people that mean a lot to him uh, that have passed away in this long sort of uh, protracted battle uh, against evil, they're all around him. And he said, will you stay with me to the end? And his mother says to him, we've never left you. So, so all throughout Harry Potter, then Harry Potter has been, has been saddled alongside of his parents who've never left him, but also moving towards the place where they're at, that, in, that, in that sense. It's a, it's a loose analogy, but it, but it kind of works here. Jesus, ever present with the believer, moving to the place where Jesus is going to prepare a place for us, moving to where Jesus reigns fully and, and, and totally. This, uh, this is, I, I think, the, the driving force. This is why Paul could say, we're, we're like sheep being led to slaughter, but we're also conquerors in the midst of all of it. Uh, is why is because the king who's already conquered is in our midst and we're going to him nothing that's happening as horrible as it is you go back to Romans 8 all that list is really scary stuff but nothing that's happening robs us of this um, and this is this is so uh, this is so motivating uh, not only are we motivated by the resurrection of Jesus, not only does that idea drive us, but the sovereignty of Jesus drives us, but the ever-present Jesus drives us. And, and of course, as we mentioned last, uh, last week, this is part of, uh, of, of what we celebrate in the Supper, is that the Jesus that we remember is not just simply the Jesus of the past, but it's the Jesus that said, I am with you always. And this is, uh, this is significant. And so not only uh, are, the, are the facts that ground us disorienting, but true and should drive us to worship, not only are the ideas that drive us are enduring the resurrection of Jesus, the sovereignty of Jesus, the ever-present Jesus, but our mission is clear. This, the, the, the text here says, uh, uh, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. And so a little bit needs to say uh, be said about this. You, the primary verb here is make disciples. And then it's saddled up with three participles, go, baptize, teach. However, the way that Matthew uses go oftentimes is uh, he utilizes it uh, in conjunction with the main verb so that it shares in the main verb's uh, a sort of um, imperative force. So, for example, if we go all the way back to Matthew 2, we can see something like this. Uh, Matthew 2, uh, verse 8. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search. So the idea wasn't search as you're going. It was a go and search. Go and search uh, was a significant kind of idea. If you, you uh, jump over to, to Matthew chapter 9, you see it one more time. Uh, Jesus, uh, as uh, he is uh, calling Matthew, he says, Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So Jesus, again, isn't saying to Matthew, learn what this means as you're kind of walking through life. So this, this is an intentional idea. Go into all the nations. And this would have been necessary. Most of the time uh, in the ancient world, uh, religion and race were completely interlocked. Uh, so that if you saw an African, if you saw a, a, a Middle Eastern, if you saw an Irish guy, if you saw a, an American in, in an ancient mind, now I know what each one of these people worship because I'm looking at them. Now for Americans, this is you know we, we, we perceive this as a is an a, almost an appropriate racial kind of ideology, and it certainly is. But it is that way because Jesus um, sort of messed this paradigm up. Uh, go and make. Disciples, go and craft followers of me. Go and make Christians uh, out of every people group. No longer, uh, because of Jesus, will race equal religion. No longer will that be the case. Uh, now, uh, all people everywhere, every tribe, tongue, and nation. This has been the, the plan from the beginning in Genesis chapter 12. Uh, that, that uh, in fact, Israel would be a blessing to all the families of the earth. And here we have the true Israel now calling 
people from everywhere uh, to uh, to come and follow him. In Acts chapter 4, uh, the apostle says, In the past, uh, God ha- has uh, allowed the nations to go their own way, but now he calls all men everywhere to repent. That's what this is saying. On the notion of uh, of go then, go and make disciples, then the idea is, is that we're ever supposed to be sort of moving outward. And that could be outward from our own church family or outward from our own comfort zones or outward uh, into the uttermost parts of the world. Certainly all of those things apply. Uh, but we always have to have this outward mentality, this centripetal force that spins us out of where we're at and into the world intentionally to make disciples. What is a disciple? Uh, there's been a great deal, it seems like, of confusion on this. Um Mantras like every disciple is a Christian, but not every Christian is a disciple, just betrays a horrible sort of doctrinal commitment. Uh, and uh, that probably is driven more by the pragmatic need to kind of explain people who've walked the aisle, said the prayer, and then abandoned the faith than it, than it is an actual real read of the Bible. Uh, a real read of the Bible is simple. A disciple is a Christian. In fact, in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, it is the disciples that are first called Christians. There's no such thing as this Christian as being sort of a a first uh, rate believer and disciples being an extra second rate believer. The disciples are just those who are following Jesus and they're called Christians. The, the, The fact that the disciples are first called Christians in Antioch also probably reflects kind of a label a pejorative label, a kind of a label, a pejorative just simply meaning that, that it's a label that you call, a, a name that you call somebody that you're trying to actually insult them with. Uh, and uh, But it's a label that shows that the disciples were now separated from uh, whatever race they were about, whether they were Greek or whether they were Jewish, and now they were oriented to the person of Jesus. And this is incredible. Uh, these, this is what Jesus wants. Jesus wants us to call all people everywhere to abandon everything that they've claimed to be God, everything that they've trusted to be God, and turn to him. Uh, and, and, and making disciples is, is, is holistic here. It is evangelism. It is calling people to, to do what we just said. But it's actually a, a very full sense of evangelism. There is no such thing as evangelism in the, in the New Testament that calls people to, to make a decision, walk an aisle, say a prayer that, it, that, that shifts them from the damned column to the saved column, but then doesn't have any effect on their normal lives. The the call of Jesus was for total commitment. It was for love for God and neighbor. It was for constant vigilant prayer. It was for perseverance and suffering. It was for patience and boldness and watchfulness and faith and dependence and joy and praise. It was for testimony and witness, stewardship of wealth and possessions. It was for commitment to the lost and embracing each of these. And, and an ongoing maturing way is in fact through the power of the Holy Spirit is in fact what a disciple was and what a disciple is and those things are significant so Jesus says go go spin into the world into your world and call people to 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 see the reality of me no matter how disorienting and to follow me and part of that is baptizing and teaching Baptism, uh, baptism, rather, in the uh, the New Testament is just simply a, one of uh, um, uh, f- uh, five complex of activities, uh, components that would have meant that you were saved. Um, like when I was uh, raised in Alabama, if someone was to say, "Hey, when were you saved?" I might answer the question by saying, "Well, I walked the aisle at, at thus and such day," or I might say, "Well, I." signed a card or raised my hand or said a prayer or I might say well I was uh, I, I, I prayed to ask Jesus into my heart and was baptized when so I had this you know, this 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 set of things that I would that I would say that anybody would say uh, back in the south when they were asked the question when were you saved in the New Testament when were you saved might be a- answered by well um, I repented from my sin thus and such day, or I believed thus and such day, or I confessed Jesus openly as risen Lord thus and such day, or I, or I was, or God brought me from death to life at this day, or I professed to the world through baptism on this day. They would have, and, and they would have probably connected it. Like it's connected multiple times. These, these elements are connected multiple times without the other elements 
in the New Testament, but each writer wants you to hear all of the elements every time they say any of the elements. So, for example, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, uh, when uh, uh, Peter is asked, what can we do, what must we do to be saved? He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. Well, so you don't have to believe? So God doesn't have to do any converting work there? Uh, so there doesn't have to really be a confession, an open confession. Um, those, those ideas, of course, the apostle would have said, well, of course there does. Uh, of course, it has to be all of that stuff. Or Romans 9, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead, you'll be saved. So no baptism? No, of course not. Now, the apostle would have said, well, no, of course. You, you're baptized. It's a proclamation of the reality of what happened to you. This is my proclamation to the world. Maybe I don't know how to articulate what happened to me very well. I know when I got baptized, I didn't know how to articulate it, but I didn't have to. My baptism did. I have been graciously captured by Jesus. And because of that, I've died with Jesus. And I've been buried with Jesus. And I've been raised with Jesus. And, and so, therefore, I am proclaiming my union with Christ in this act. And so this, this is a, a huge important act, uh, and, and, it's, and it's fundamental to uh, the, the disciples. And it might also say that disciples, though they may, uh, though you may have instances of private disciples, secret disciples, like we found with Joseph Arimathea uh, uh, last week, you, um, you, you, this is not something that, that remains private. Neither did it with Joseph. Joseph played his cards at some point with, here is where you play your cards. You openly profess I belong to Jesus now because Jesus has captured me and I've died with him and I've been buried with him and I've raised with him. And now death is uh, the only thing that I fear of death now is the process. But I don't fear the outcome of death uh, because of Jesus. And, and so you're, you're, you you baptize these people, but you also teach them. You teach them everything. Our mission is to go and make disciples. Our mission is in making disciples to 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 provide them a holistic portrait of what a disciple is, and and for them to profess this publicly uh, by their baptism, but also to shape them and to take time to train them. Um, I remember early on as a Christian asking. Uh, Two pastors, actually. Would you take the time to just sort of teach me? I don't know anything. And they said, no. I, I'll never forget that. It stung a little. I'm not going to lie. But, but also, it was just sort of disorienting. Wouldn't you want to do this? And, and in their minds, uh, you know, whatever they were doing from the pulpit was sufficient, and I didn't need to ask for anything else. But here, teaching is necessary teaching who Jesus is, teaching what Jesus said, teaching what Jesus did, all of these things. In fact, I've, I've told our interns and, uh, um, and, and, uh, and people who, uh, and the guys who we, we have coming towards eldership on more than one occasion, our position as elders are, is fairly simple. We stand um, uh, in, in between the bride of Jesus and the groom, Jesus, the king. And our job is to convince the bride of the absolute beauty of Jesus. The worst possible thing we could do is convince the bride, somehow or another, of the absolute beauty and trustworthiness of us. Our whole job is to simply shift their eyes, ever shift their eyes towards the beauty of Jesus. And this kind of thing is, I think, what Jesus is saying. Teach them. Teach them everything that I've commanded. Um, this is... Um, this is 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 got to be the focus of of what we do. In fact, this encapsulates so much. This is why other churches uh, need to always know that they're safe on our lips and safe in our hearts. This is why other uh, believers uh, should know that that uh, that that we are uh, that we're generous in the way that we think about them because they belong to Jesus. Uh, because and Jesus said, "Love one another." The lost will know you belong to me if you love each other. That's ironic and kind of counterintuitive to probably what we've been taught for a, a, a quite a bit. But that is Jesus saying that. And, and those, those, those things are supposed to drive us. These things here provide clarity for our mission. Uh, our, our, the, the historical facts that ground us are, are significant. They are true, even though they're disorienting. The ideas that drive us are enduring ideas. The resurrection of Jesus, the sovereignty of the resurrected Jesus, uh, the ever-presentness of Jesus, and the mission that we have is clear. 
Go intentionally into the world. Call people to Jesus. And in calling them to Jesus, call them to all it is to follow Jesus. Because Jesus is worth all that there is to follow him. And, 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 so, and so as we move out of Matthew, then let's be like the disciples. Let us be constantly listening to the voice of Jesus, longing to understand the voice of Jesus, longing to obey. Let us uh, move with a sense of, even if we're disoriented by, uh, of, uh, by our lack of faith, we want to be like the man in John 6 and just say to Jesus, help us in our unbelief. And Jesus does. He does. He doesn't say, nope, I'm just going to wait till you can believe. He doesn't. He says, he, he goes ahead and he helps us because he knows we're frail. And so even if we're disoriented, even if we're doubting, even if we're, we're hesitant, let us worship Jesus, believing best we can, knowing that Jesus is better than our belief and that Jesus will continue to, to minister to us. Um, let us be driven by the resurrection of Jesus, by the sovereignty of Jesus, by the beauty of Jesus. Let us be driven by the fact that Jesus is ever present with us. And let us go into Hebrews and longing to know more about Jesus, longing to know who Jesus is as our high priest, longing to know who Jesus is as God Almighty, blessed forever, longing to know what he's done. Uh, let, let's, let's move out of this book and into the next with that hunger, with that appetite. And if our appetite is waning, again, Again, worship, but ever disorient, worshipful, but ever disorienting. It's you're, that just means you may be a normal Christian. Then just bow before Jesus still and ask Jesus, confess to Jesus your weakness, confess to Jesus your lack of desire as we move out of Matthew and into Hebrews and, and ask him and throughout the book of Hebrews to, to whet your desire, to increase your desire, to increase your appetite, to know him, to love him, to obey him. And as we continue to move, let's just not forget we have a mission here. Uh, this is th this is ever present. Uh, this is uh, not so much that that people people are always supposed to be willing to leave us and go to other countries. And if you don't know other countries, you also need to be willing to financially support those who go to other countries. That is a part of it. But that part is supposed to be natural. Like I shouldn't have to teach or I shouldn't have to talk any of us in to supporting people overseas. If in fact our natural tendency is outward. If our natural tendency is to spin outward into the world, then that's part of our appetite is to long to see those that we can't get to, to also be called to Christ. And so let's pray to that end, that we would have those appetites. Pray to that end, that we would see this clear mission in front of us. Pray to the end, that we would be motivated and driven by the resurrected, sovereign Jesus who's always with us. Pray to the end, that we would not be uh, find ourselves staggering in the face of some of the most amazing elements of Jesus, but that we would bow our head and worship, confident that Jesus is better than we could possibly imagine and ever present with us, and more powerful than death. I hope that this time through Matthew has been encouraging, and I pray that as we move uh, on into Hebrews, that Jesus will be magnified at Redeemer Baptist Church, and will be glorified and full of pleasure because his people love him, love his bride, and long to speak the truth of Jesus to the world around us. Pray with me. Father, in the name of Christ, grant us grace, Father, to believe the facts of who you are and what you've done, to be driven by the reality of your resurrection and your sovereignty uh, and the fact that you're always with us, which we're so grateful for, and to see the mission clearly before us and to be ever vigilant to fulfill it. We pray all of this, Father, in the name of Christ. Amen. I miss you, Redeemer. We'll see you soon, by God's grace.
we continue to respond to the goodness, love, and mercy of God by giving. We give now to the work of Redeemer Baptist Church. As we always say, um, if if you do not um, belong to Redeemer Baptist Church through membership or or attendance, um, we're happy you're watching. But we're not asking um, anything of you uh, in this time. But if you if you do belong to Redeemer, you know this is how uh, we respond together. And so, b- before we take some time to do that, would you please pray with me? God, we thank you for your provision, and ask that you would. Make much of yourself through um, what is given today. Make much of yourself um, in places near and far. And in this time, we pray for those who, who are afraid, who are doubting your provision. God, we, we pray that you would provide work for many, um, continued work or new work. We, we ask that you would um, help us to um, to provide for one another as well, that we we might be a blessing um, to those in the church um, and to those in um, in our lives. We pray all this through Christ. Amen. Well, again, we're going to take two minutes. There's instructions on the screen um, on how to give. Let's take some time and do that now. As we always do, as our time nears an end, um, let's take just a few moments to quietly and silently reflect on what we've heard and sung and prayed, all that we've done today. Amen. Well, as we have certainly been reminded today, God commissions us out into the world. And so we do that each week. We um, read our commissioning statement to push one another out, uh, out into the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So would you please read our commissioning statement with me? Our Father, since you are infinitely worthy of praise, Jesus, since you are king over all things forever, 
Spirit, since we believe you can show the hardest of hearts and minds, the beauty of Jesus and the ugliness of sin, we will go into all the world, our world, and we will love the gospel dearly, speak the gospel clearly, and live the gospel sincerely. For your glory, our joy, and for the peace of those who will be saved by your grace, because we love them enough to share. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Love and miss you all. The Lord is with you. Have a great day.